Hey, good morning, Catalyst Church. Welcome. We're glad that you're joining us online this morning. Would you just stand wherever you are, and we can just worship together today, God. Let's pray. Jesus, God, it's a weird time we're in, Lord, but we know that you're in control. God, and we worship you. We give you praise. We give you shouts. God, and we sing to you this morning. God, we invite you into our homes, into our hearts. God, would you work in us? God, give us hope. Give us peace. God, and just work in us this morning. God, we prepare our hearts, and we welcome you in. We worship you today. Come on, church. We're going to sing together today. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a
going to sing a new song this morning. These lyrics are especially powerful in this moment with all we're facing. I just pray that we would feel secure today in Jesus.
bring it all to peace. Storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still. The rage in me to still every way. At your name, Jesus, Jesus. Tremble, Jesus, Jesus, we silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, bring all these longs to live, and call these longs to see what's a Shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, for shadows can't deny your name. Can't be overcome. 
stay in an attitude of prayer this morning and worship before our God. Jesus, that is the name. That is the name that we declare. That is the name that we cling tightly to. That is the name that we turn to. Because in truth, we turn to the person who bears that name. His name is Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask you this morning that you would aid us, you would empower us as we turn to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That it wouldn't just be, that it wouldn't just be air passing through our vocal cords and our lips and mouths and tongues. It would be instead a declaration of truth that resonates, resonates and the earthly realms resonates in the heavenly realms with the name as we declare it. And everything shakes, everything trembles at that name. Lord Jesus, so many of us are struggling. So many of us have challenges and issues, even just flat out problems. And we turn to you. We turn to you, Jesus, because at your name, the darkness trembles. At your name, the fears are silenced. So my declaration is that every person struggling with a fear right now, that fear would be silenced in Jesus' name. Every person feeling the encroachment of the darkness in their life, that darkness will tremble and that darkness will flee in Jesus' name. That is my declaration and I cling to it, I hold to it because I know I believe, I declare that the name of Jesus Christ is powerful. It is mighty to save. And so we lay hold of it today. Heavenly Father, would you be delighted as we lift up the name of your Son, as we lift up the name of Jesus, high over all the earth, but most importantly in this moment, we lift the name of Jesus high over the darkness. We lift the name of Jesus high over the fears. They have no place in our life. They have no place in our families. They have no place in our businesses. They have no place in our schools. Fear and darkness has no place in our community. It has no place in our heart, no place in our mind. It has no place, oh, it has no place in our soul. Darkness and fear be gone in Jesus' name. That is our declaration. So Heavenly Father, as we lift the name of Jesus, we trust that you will cause the darkness to flee and you will silence the fear once and for all in our hearts. And we will walk into light and we will walk into confidence and courage and strength. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Catalyst Church, I hope you can lay hold of that tonight. God loves you. God, oh, he's so committed to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, welcome. We're so glad that you could be here this morning and be with us. We're glad that you chose to be a part of this online gathering. Listen, these are challenging times and we understand and we know that there's so many things competing for our attention and we want to say that we're honored that you would choose to give attention to what Jesus is doing in you and what Jesus is doing through Catalyst Church. We appreciate you very much. If you're a guest, we especially want to say welcome to you. Thanks for joining us today. 
If you are a guest, we, we'd love to connect with you. Right there on your screen, there should be a little button that says first time guests, or you can uh, add in a comment, or even better, the best is this. If you would just simply text the word Catalyst to our connections number, that's 509-385-0811, just the word Catalyst to 509-385-0811. Our connections team wants to, well, they want to connect with you and say welcome to the Catalyst Church family. Hallelujah. Hey, we're going to take a moment now, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord with the tithes and offerings. Thank you so much, everyone, for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord through the ministries of Catalyst Church. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to be on mission with you. You have called us by name, and you have challenged us to be a part of transformation in the lives of people. And it is, a, it is a privilege and an honor that you've called us to that. And thank you for your provision in our lives. As we worship and honor you, Lord, with the tithes and with the offerings, we simply ask, and we've asked it many times, Lord, but we'll do it one more time. We ask that you would multiply it beyond our abilities as you leverage it forward into stories of grace and mercy and transformation. We believe and declare that the gospel is powerful, the message of hope that Jesus came and Jesus died and Jesus rose and Jesus is coming again, Lord. That is a message we hold on to and we declare it. So we ask that as we give and receive of the tithes, of the offerings, Lord, that you would turn them into stories of grace. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you very much for giving, everyone. So glad to have you here today. We are beginning a brand new series this morning entitled Words. Now, I want to begin, though, I want to begin this new series with a, a brilliant, uh, insightful observation. Are you ready for it? Maybe you want to get a, a piece of paper and a pen, write this down. This is brilliant. Our society needs to take a deep breath and maybe take a nap. Wow. <laughs> I mean, come on. Everyone is seriously cranky about most everything right now. When I was planning this series, and honestly, it was quite a while ago, many months ago, I had no idea just how important and volatile this issue of words would prove to be, and how timely even this series uh, would turn out to be. You've probably heard time and time again recently, you know, we just need to talk about it. Yes, but just talking may not be the solution, especially when using words has been the problem to start with. We need to use the right words. We need to use the right words, especially if we want to see solutions. You know, the single most influential speaker in human history, believe it or not, was not a politician, not a celebrity, wasn't an orator or a, uh, a military leader, wasn't a, a wealthy business tycoon. He was an itinerant carpenter turned rabbi. Well, of course, it's Jesus. You get that. And I know, you might even be thinking, well, yeah, it's Jesus, but his impact, you know, was partly because he was also divine. Sure, I get that. But, you know, if we examine Jesus' earthly ministry, and we quickly will discover that he didn't lead with his power. He didn't even lead necessarily with his actions, he certainly didn't lead with his miracles. He led with his words. And sometimes he would add miracles. Typically, though, if you really look carefully, you'll realize he only used miracles when the situation absolutely required it. But he led with words. Did you know that even his first foray into spiritual leadership didn't involve power at all? It was entirely words. Turn with me if you would. 
We're going to be in the, the New Testament book of Luke to start off with. In Luke chapter 2, oh, where are we? Luke chapter 2, we're going to be at verse 46 here for a few moments. Luke 2, 46. This is when Jesus and uh, his parents, uh, they've taken him to Jerusalem when he was younger. And here it is, uh, and after they've left, of course, maybe you remember the story that Joseph and Mary have lost track of their son, you know, in Jerusalem and it took them a few days to find him. Actually, they had been out of Jerusalem for a few days before they realized that he wasn't even with them. The, verse 46 of chapter 2 in Luke, three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Now look at this in verse 47. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His first foray into spiritual leadership was words. Remember a little later when Jesus was being tempted by Satan to abandon his mission? Jesus didn't even use his power to stop the attack, did he? No, each time he spoke words, specifically scripture. You'll find it there in Luke chapter 4. I'll just read you a few spots here where it says, you know, but Jesus told him three times Satan attacked him to try and convince him to quit his mission. But look at this. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. A little farther on, Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. A little further on, yet again, Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must, must not test the Lord your God. Each time Jesus spoke words, couldn't he have just like, I don't know, zapped Satan? Probably. He did not. He spoke words. When Jesus announced the start of his, his earthly ministry, he did so by publicly declaring himself as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy about the anointed one. The anointed one of God who would usher in the kingdom of God. A little further on Luke chapter 4, oh, is it verse 17? It says this, you know, he, you know when he came to, or verse 16, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. Verse 17, the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. It's interesting that Isaiah's prophecy there, it does include displays of power, but it starts with an anointing to proclaim words first. You know, the first miracle of healing that Luke records involves a man possessed with a, an unclean spirit. You'll find it a little further on in Luke chapter 4. Oh, where are we going to be? Luke Chapter 4, let's say 31, verse 31. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every day. There, too, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. And once when he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, cried out, shouting, Go away, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Catch this, verse 35. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. And at that, the demon threw the man to the floor as the crowd watched it. Came out of him without hurting him any further. Amazed, the people proclaimed what authority and power this man's words possess. Look at what Jesus says. In fact, I will give you the the unauthorized bill translation of what Jesus said to this demon. He said, shut up and get out. Isn't that interesting? And don't miss the people's reaction. What is this message? Jesus' words were more noticeable to them than the deliverance isn't that crazy? I don't know about you, but if I'm walking down the street and I watch a guy get delivered of a demon, I'm probably not going to focus on the words as much as I am going to be the wow. 
But these people are more impacted by the message that Jesus is proclaiming than they are the blatant display of divine power they just witnessed. Later on in his ministry, Jesus would utter the words that will serve as our theme verse for this entire series. But more, you know, more than just in, uh, you know, providing a theme verse, his teaching provides you and I with an empirical proof test of the true condition of ourselves, our hearts, and of one another. Turn with me, if you would, Luke chapter 6, verse 45. I want to read this one out of the English Standard Version. I like just the way it's phrased a little bit. Jesus says the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. I know, I know. Totally unfair, isn't it? It's probably even an imprecise test. Who has the right to take someone's words and judge the content and the condition of their heart? Well, apparently Jesus does. And the context of this verse is about correctly judging the spiritual trustworthiness of one another. So maybe you and I, we put a little less effort into complaining about this truth and more effort into ensuring that our own words, which reflect our heart, are filled with quality treasure. Jesus just gave us an empirical proof test of who we actually are, of what's going on in here. And it is our words. So likely throughout this series, I'll probably end up reminding us, you know, a few times, but let me throw this out there right now. Even though we are, you know, and we are and we will be talking about our speech, we'll be talking about our tongue and our, our words so much, we have got to assume that our thumbs and our typing and our clicking are the same in this context. Texting, typing, clicking, sharing, forwarding, posting, it doesn't make any difference. They are your words. You know, our, we have a, a men's group that meets on Wednesday mornings here at our, at our Colfax campus, and, and it's called Forged, and it's men and just in an unashamed pursuit of wisdom. And we've been studying the book of Proverbs now for nearly, nearly a year. I can't believe our Forged group is almost one year old. So every Wednesday morning, oh, dark, awful, uh, we are there studying the book of Proverbs together. And the book of Proverbs has several themes in it. One of those themes is identifying what makes a wise person and what makes one a fool. And most often in Proverbs, the key to distinguishing the wise from the fool, you're never going to guess what it is, it is their words. And because we're allowing words to perform a, a simple equation of distinguishing the wise from the fool, we're going to be examining today and for the, the next four weeks, simple either or arrangements. We're going to be looking at deception versus truth. We're going to be looking at harm versus healing, discouraging versus encouraging, useless versus useful. Today, we are going to start with destroying versus creating. And I want all of us to beware the sting of the snout band. Snout band is an old English word. And it refers to one who, oh boy, you've probably come up with this person. I know you and I, we would never do this, of course. But we've come across this person. A snout band is the one who, you know, interrupts 
people. He interrupts or she interrupts either to contradict or to, you know, supposedly correct. Basically, a snout band is one who jabs at another with their words. You, you know that person, don't you? They jab, they stab, they cut with their words. They use their words as a destructive device. Turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 12. In Proverbs chapter 12, we're going to look at, we're, boy, we're going to look at a bunch of Proverbs throughout this series and starting today. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Some people make cutting remarks. You know, in kindergarten, we all learned, didn't we, to declare a lie together? Come on, say it with me. Are you ready? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is absolute rubbish. Come on, give me hurtling objects any day. In my experience, when I get hit with things, literally, sticks, stones, whatever, small mammals, doesn't matter, whatever I get hit with, those things heal. When I get hit with words, that healing process takes a lot longer. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will absolute lie. Not only do we all know that this is a lie, come on, bear with me. We've all been on the wrong side of it, haven't we? We've all used our words to cut another person down, to harm them in some way whether it's the bite of a sarcastic response or even a planned attack with our words. We master this skill very early on in our language development. And then we polish it to an absolute art form when we become teenagers. Right? Come on. Turn back a proverb there, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9. With their words, Proverbs eleven nine. with their words, the godless destroy their friends, but knowledge will rescue the righteous. With their words, the godless destroy their friends. Words have a power to destroy as nothing else can. Words that are used cutting, you know, the snout band words, they are the ones that can rob confidence, can't they? They're the ones that create self-doubt in us. They're the ones that ruin relationships. They're the words that undermine trust. And the list can go on and on and on, can't it? Using, but here, using destructive words doesn't just harm others. Look at this, Proverbs 12. Oh, I hate this one. I mean, I love it, I hate it, whatever. You know, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 13. The wicked are trapped by their own words, but the godly escape such trouble. Oh, we can go a little further. You ready for this one? I mean, as long as we're beating ourselves up a little bit right now and setting the stage for deliverance, here we go. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 6. Fool's words get them into constant quarrels. They are asking for a beating. The mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. See, destructive words don't just hurt other people. Destructive words, when you and I use them, they also hurt us. Our destructive words serve as a, a trap for ourselves. But not just when we get caught, you know, deceiving or we tangle ourselves up. Here's where the trap really gets insidious. We become identified in the minds of others as one who destroys. We get a reputation for how we use our words. I have a few individuals in my life whom I am purposely around as little as possible. I mean the bare minimum of time. And it is simply because I know who they are based 
on the way they speak. Is that judgy? Yes. It's absolutely judgy. And I am unashamed to protect myself that way. Why would I go around someone? Why would I spend time doing life with someone who destroys others purposefully or just carelessly? I'm supposed to spend more time with them? I'm supposed to submit myself to their abuse further? No, bare minimum. I want to make sure that we understand the practical implications of this very spiritual truth. Our tongues belong to us, but they are all too often at the ready to be used by the enemy of our souls. The enemy speaks to us through people. Incidentally, I, I, was, I was thinking of that the other day, and I went and did a, a quick search through, actually it took me a little while, but a quick search through Scripture. Did you know that Eve and Jesus are the only persons recorded in Scripture to which Satan has ever spoken directly. Come on. Maybe we shouldn't concern ourselves with an audible voice from hell. Maybe we need to pay more notice or pay more heed to notice when hell's voice is speaking through someone next to you. Or when hell's voice is speaking through your Facebook feed. We also got to make sure to carefully guard our own mouths to make certain that we aren't inadvertently being used to speak destruction in someone else's life. You know, I think of Peter. I don't think Peter intended to speak on Satan's behalf when he contradicted Jesus. You remember Jesus was sharing with his disciples, you know, the the events of the next few days prior to his crucifixion, that he would be handed over, that he would be betrayed, that he would be tried falsely, that he would be killed. And what does Peter say? Forbid it, Lord. And what does Jesus say to Peter? You remember it. Because it's crazy. He looks at Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Are you kidding? Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter allowed himself to inadvertently be used by the enemy to contradict the mission and purpose of the Lord Most High. Do you think that's what Peter got up that morning planning? I don't think so either. But it happened nonetheless. We've got to be careful that we aren't inadvertently being used by the enemy to destroy someone else. Okay. Come on, let's get off this destruction thing. Let's spin it now to the contrast, shall we? Let's do it by, I actually want to reverse a proverb, if we will. Let's go back to Proverbs, verse 15, or Proverbs 15, rather. Verse 4, the proverb says, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. I want to read this proverb, though. I want to spin it from uh, destructing to creating. How about this? Perversion of tongue crushes the spirit, but a soothing tongue is a tree of life. A soothing tongue is a tree of... Man, I love that imagery. Words as a tree of life, providing strength, providing nourishment, providing shelter and shade, providing stability, providing resource... Words as a tree of life, a life-giving tree. You know, we got some time left. We're online, so that means we can use all the bandwidth on the internet if we want. Let's explore that metaphor a little bit. Let's talk about some of these metaphor of a tree of life in our words. Roots that nourish. Let's start there. The roots of a tree nourish it. You know, the smallest part of the tree does the most work and has the most value Never ever underestimate how the tiniest words of encouragement, the smallest words of gratitude can actually feed the soul of another. Turn with me, if you would, Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25, I want to read a couple of verses here, beginning at verse 11. 
Timely advice is lovely, like golden apples in a silver basket. To one who listens, valid criticism is like a gold earring or other gold jewelry. Trustworthy messengers refresh like snow in summer. They revive the spirit of their employer. Roots nourish, words nourish in the tree of life that is words. And they nourish the trunk, that trunk that supports, that trunk of the tree that strengthens. You know, the, the, the structure and the stability of a tree is, is truly an amazing thing. Did you get this? Even when the tree is dead, that strength and structure is amazing. Where do you think lumber comes from? Dead trees. Even when the tree is no longer living, it's got value and strength and stability resources. So we go from roots to trunk. We have the branches of this tree that are reaching out. Our words have this reaching effect to them. Think of how far our words can reach to provide encouragement and wisdom, and knowledge. The words of a, of a wise grandparent can carry for generations. And words can provide even a, a covering and a shade, kind of a protection from the elements. How about fruit? Fruit, the, the legacy of, of fruit. A tree's fruit answers, you know, it answers both the immediate needs and the future needs. There's legacy in our words that feed ourselves and our families and our friends immediately and in the future. Back there at Proverbs, again, I told you we're going to be here a whole lot. Do me a favor, while we're in this series, just memorize the entire book of Proverbs. It'll speed things up. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. Wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. I like that. Wise words satisfy like a good meal. The right words bring satisfaction. There's a legacy in the fruit of this tree of the words of life. And you know, taken holistically, the whole thing, there's, a, there's a, a whole impacting ecosystem of a tree. A healthy tree is an entire ecosystem in itself, creates an environment where, you know, far more things can live and things can thrive than merely the tree itself. Birds and insects and other plants and things like that, Sasquatch, whatever, you know, anything can live in the ecosystem of that tree. So it isn't just the tree itself that is life and giving life, it's all of the things impacted by it. Our words, your words, my words, create an entire ecosystem around us and around our lives. I guess here's my point. Our words are far more than merely vowels and consonants strung together and ascribed with meaning. Scripture declares to us how our words are a force that destroys or creates. Remember, God spoke the universe into existence. I think this, this truth is very concisely st stated in, oh, oh, look, it's in Proverbs. No way. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Look at that. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Look at that first clause. The tongue can bring death or life. Our words, they destroy or they create. I want to invite our worship team to make their way back this morning as we wrap up our time. I want to, I want to go to the New Testament for a, a few moments here. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, the Apostle Paul writes this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Paul says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Let me read that again for us. 
Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. What will we do with this today? What are we going to do with our words? How are we going to use them? I was challenged many years ago. One of my professors in college. I don't know that he really intended it to be this big a deal. He made a little comment that just absolutely hit home to me. And I have carried it with me ever since. He just said, treat your words like employees. That was it. Treat your words like employees. Some of them need a raise. They're doing a great job. Some of them need some new opportunities because they've got potential. And you know where I'm going, don't you? Some of your employees flat out need to be fired and canned. Uh, Oh, that's challenged me over the years. You and I have a responsibility to treat our words, well, like employees. What words are you employing? Now, I know we are so ingrained in the victim culture that we, well, you know, yeah, I've got some crazy employees. They never show up on time. They never do what I ask them to do, blah, 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 blah. Shut up, victim. These are your words. These are my words. And Jesus didn't give us a caveat. It tells you the condition of your heart. Well, unless you really have some, now come on. Words distinguish the wise from the fool. Your words distinguish you as wise or foolish. My words distinguish me as either wise or foolish. So I'm going to repeat that question again. What are we going to do with this? What are you and I going to do with our words? How are you and I going to employ the right ones? That's what we're exploring throughout this whole season. But I want to start with this. Well, actually, I want to end with the same thing we started with. There was a single word that we kept uttering this morning. Our worship team led it, led us in it. I prayed through that word, the name. That word is the name. It's Jesus. So more than just what are we going to do with our words, what are you and I going to do with one word? What are we going to do with the word Jesus? You know, let me invite you. Because maybe you've been one that, you, you know, you know that you need to do something with that word. You need to do something with that person, with that name. You need to make a decision. Can I invite you? Maybe today is the day. Maybe it's time to drop excuses and drop the victim stuff and instead embrace the word that will transform you like nothing else. That word is Jesus. Would you pray with me? If you're ready to make that decision today, would you pray with me? Let's pray. Pray, just follow along. Use your own words, follow my words, whatever. I, I really only care what's in your heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you have given us, you have given me the gift of Jesus. The name above every other name, the name at which every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. The word which causes the demons to tremble. The name which sparks fear into the heart of the enemy. The name which delivers the name which heals, the name which encourages, the name which strengthens, the name which is life-giving. 
his name is Jesus. So Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my own destructive words, my own abusive language. Forgive me. Wash me and cleanse me of that. Implant within my heart, within my mind, implant within my soul the life-giving word. Change me and transform me in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved according to God's word. According to the scripture, you are a follower of Christ. And we want to celebrate with you. Do us a favor. Text the word saved, S-A-V-E-D to the number you see on your screen there. And again, we'd like to connect with you. We have a, a, a resource that we would like to send out to you called Start Dreaming. It's really just about the first steps in pursuing God's best for your life. For all of us, can I encourage us today that we are responsible for our words and we have before us the choice Will they destroy? Will they create? I don't know about you, but I absolutely, I am done with words that destroy. Now, in my own life, that means you're probably going to have to get used to a lot of silence from me. Because i got to learn some new stuff. i got to learn some new tricks. How about you? But I'm done with words in my employment that don't produce life. I want life. I want words that matter. I want words that transform. I want words with legacy and power. I want to use words that change destinies. I think Jesus wants us to do that too. Hallelujah. Come on, I want to close our time together and let's do it. Let's declare that name that name above every other name. As our worship team leads us, let's declare the one who makes the darkness tremble, the one who silences fear. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name My declaration as we end our time together today my declaration that our words in the days ahead the rest of today even would begin to switch 
Listen, I'm not heaping blame. I'm not heaping condemnation or guilt or shame. I'm just calling it out. Sometimes our language needs to change. That our words begin to switch from darkness into light, from fear into confidence, from victim into responsibility and accountability, from destroying into creating. Come on, from death into life. My declaration for you and for me. I hope you can hold on to this. I hope you can grasp it. I believe it and I declare it that our words will transform in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Catalyst Church, go in the grace and the power and the might of God. Hallelujah. We love you. We look forward to seeing you again soon here at Catalyst Church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord.